Hello, and welcome to Western Civ, episode 156, Henry the Navigator. Everyone knows the name Christopher Columbus. His voyage, and actually there were four, we'll get into that, across the Atlantic in 1492, is often taught in schools as the beginning of the Age of Discovery. That, however, would be wrong. The reality is that Columbus built off of the efforts of others who began the Age of Discovery in the early 15th century. And no one was more instrumental in those early efforts than the Portuguese man known today in history as Henry the Navigator. Henry began the process of exploring the globe for Western Europeans a full 50 years before Columbus. Yet almost no one knows who he is. This is his story. Henry was born in 1394 the third surviving son of the king, John I of Portugal and his wife, Philippa, sister of King Henry IV of England. As the third son, Henry realized that he had little to no chance of inheriting the Portuguese throne. His eldest brother, Edward, was a quiet man. Second in line, Peter was much more volatile. Henry, the grandson of John of Gaunt, Duke of Lancaster, was both intense and thoughtful. He was of medium height with broad shoulders and powerful arms. He was a man built for battle, or for that matter, for the sea. The connections between Portugal and England were relatively new, but important. In 1387, King John had wed Philippa of Lancaster. At the time, John of Gaunt had hoped that if he wed his daughter to King John, then the Portuguese might aid the English in capturing Castile. King John of Portugal had no such intentions. That being said, the Portuguese marriage into the English royal house marked how much the kingdom had risen in the last 100 years. Henry was born as Portugal's modern-day boundaries were coming into being, as the Reconquista was wrapping itself up. Thus, and some authors make much of this, in order to earn their martial glory, the young man of Spain and Portugal now had to look beyond the Iberian Peninsula for the first time. Henry's early life was relatively unremarkable. We are told he was brave and did all the things one might expect an early modern prince might do. But our story really begins... In 1415, when Henry was 21 years old. If one had visited Lisbon in early July of 1415, the most immediately apparent fact would have been the intense preparations obviously underway. All along the harbor, shipwrights worked feverishly to fulfill royal orders. The question was, What was the Portuguese King John going to do with all these ships? What was the point? For three years, European courts had asked each other, and King John, I mean, what was the purpose of this massive fleet that you're building? King John would say little, choosing to keep his final destination secret. Only his immediate family and closest advisors knew where the fleet was going. And as the fleet set sail, plague once more ravaged the city. But Prince Henry, standing at the helm, he knew well aware what the final destination was. The Portuguese had long taken aim at Cuta. Cuta was a key and Moorish city across the Straits of Gibraltar in what is today Morocco. It was a massively important trading city where the caravans from the desert reached the Mediterranean and sent their wares into Europe. 
Its importance as a trading post was well known to Europeans. Kyuta was the location where the first paper factory had been built in the West. To Kyuta came the ceramics and carpets from the Near East, and ivory and gold from the African interior, and that I mentioned slaves. Kyuta was one of the most lucrative slave depots in Africa. One of the consequences, actually, of Kyuta's capture by the Portuguese would be to bring Europeans more fully into the slave trade. A consequence that would prove dire in the decades and centuries to come. But I should also mention that Kyuta was stoutly defended. If the Portuguese could break into Africa, they might be able to chip away at the Moorish power base that stretched from the Atlantic to Tunisia, but that was a big if. Since the Second Crusade, the Portuguese efforts at taking Kyuta would be the first concerted European effort to carve out a foothold in Africa. Since the Second Crusade. The attack on Kyuta was a turning point, not just in European, but in world history. It would launch the Portuguese on the trade winds of the world, resulting ultimately in the colonization of Africa, the Americas, and then imperialism. And Henry the Navigator, King John's 21-year-old prince, he was in charge of the attack. Cuta itself lies just across from the Rock of Gibraltar. While the Moors held both sides of the strait, Cuta was more important than the European side. From the city, the Moors could launch pirate expeditions to the islands of the Mediterranean. Moreover, with control over the states, which Cuta gave more than the European side. Portuguese and other European fleets would never be able to move freely. Heck, the Phoenicians themselves recognized the importance of the location, constructing a settlement there nearly 2,000 years prior. The city itself lies on a peninsula that juts out into the Mediterranean, and only 14 miles across the sea is Europe. The entire African side is dominated by Mount Haku, which rises almost 700 feet above the ocean below. The time for the invasion was perfect. The Reconquista was wrapping itself up. In 1411, King John had signed a peace treaty with Castile, his Spanish neighbor to the west. Still, interestingly enough, King John didn't want to go to war. Rather, it was Prince Henry who convinced him that Portugal could not pass up the chance to seize Cuta, and how right he was. According to our sources, quote, It is quite true that all the king's sons greatly wanted to see the project, the invasion of Cuta, adopted and accomplished, but none of them desired it as strongly as Prince Henry. End quote. Having convinced his father in 1412, King John issued a secret directive to his subordinates to prepare for the invasion, the scope of which would have impressed Eisenhower before D-Day. Quote, It is necessary to find out the situation and plan of this city, Cuta, the height and thickness of its walls, the nature of its towers and turrets, so as to know what artillery will be required. Also, the anchorage that exists there, and what are the prevailing winds for the ships at high anchor, and whether the beaches are open and sufficiently undefended to allow us to disembark without great risk, or whether the sea is deep enough for us to be able to fight directly from the ships. End quote. For years, the Portuguese reconnoitered Cuta in secret. Finally, when the day came to show the king their findings, the captain determined to play a trick on him. Instead of just making a map, he rambled on about stories 
about how Kita was sure to fall to him, blah, 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 blah. When the king became so frustrated that he was about to end the meeting, the captain asked for some dry beans and a piece of ribbon. With these items, the captain then proceeded to create a perfect map of Kuta, down to illustrating the very thickness of the walls using different lengths of the ribbon. The Council of War determined that the Portuguese should make two attacks on the city. The key was to land on both sides of the peninsula and instantly cut the city off from the fortress on Mount Haku. Soon, with the plans made, both King John and his captains began planning all the riches that would soon be theirs. Prince Henry, though, he was enamored by something else. Never before had he seen such a detailed map made of a coast. He realized in an instant what this might mean. If Henry could make maps like this, he might be able to go well beyond Cuta. Now once the ships were prepared, the Portuguese orders went out to the armorers and to the mint. At this point, King John could play coy no longer. Clearly, the Portuguese fleet was not designed for peaceful purposes. Foreign merchants quickly spread the news. Portugal was gearing up for war. And still, the target of all these preparations was kept secret. King John told ambassadors from Castile to Aragon that he had no intention of attacking them. With Granada, to whom Cuta, by the way, technically belonged, he was more guarded, saying that he had no intentions on Granada itself, but said nothing about Africa. This persisted for nearly three years, as the king was leaving nothing for chance. Then, King John decided on a ruse. He sent secret messengers to Holland and made a pact for peace. While he did this, in public, he declared that Portugal would go to war with Holland. Interestingly, throughout all of Europe, only William, the King of Holland, knew that this was a ruse. Quickly, word spread to North Africa, and the Moors breathed a sigh of relief. Said sigh would be short-lived. On July 25th, 1415, hardly a month before the Battle of Agincourt, the Portuguese fleet set sail. It was a massive fleet carrying 50,000 total men, including 20,000 men-at-arms. All in all, by the way, that's more men than would take part in the famous Battle of Agincourt, which was about to happen in August. At the same time, the Mediterranean galley still dominated among sailing ships recently perfected by the Venetians and the Genoese. These, of course, had two or three banks of oars that were significantly longer than their classical counterparts. Because these oars were much heavier, as many as seven men manned each one, these ships didn't have sails, some had one, and were much, much, much better suited for the relatively calm waters of the Mediterranean than the vicious currents of the ocean. So the vast majority of the ships that would bear this huge army to Cuta or of this Mediterranean type. At first, the governor of Cuta was worried as he spotted some of this fleet making its way towards his city. But then, poor conditions forced much of the flotilla back, and the governor took this as a sign that the fleet intended to attack Gibraltar instead on the European side. Hence, he erroneously relaxed. He ordered a few cannons fired towards the wayward few vessels that landed on the shore, though he made no real effort to stop them. In fact, in what would prove to be a disastrous decision, the governor sent his Berber tribesmen home, who were just recently summoned to defend the city of Cuta. Nine days later, when the main Portuguese fleet reappeared, and there could be no doubt that its target was Cuta. It was too late. The Berbers could not be recalled so quickly. 
The Portuguese plan of attack was simple. Prince Henry was to land with 40 ships on the eastern side of the headland. King John, with the bulk of their forces, would land on Cuta Bay to the west. The idea was that, when the signal came the next morning, both groups would attack simultaneously, and that, with the bulk of the forces to the west, Henry's forces should be relatively unopposed. On August 21st, 1415, as dawn broke, the attack commenced. The enemy streamed down the beach to meet the Portuguese, led by their king. As King John had foreseen, the bulk of the Moorish defenders positioned themselves to face him, leaving Henry relatively unopposed. Henry quickly took the western walls, the heavy arms and armor of his men simply too much for the lightly defended and armored defenders. In fact, when King John ordered his own forces to advance, he received word that Prince Henry was already inside the city. Thus, he ordered the gangplanks lowered, and an immediate all-out assault began. King John was wounded in the leg early on in the fighting and forced to wait by the main city gate as his men took the city. As the Portuguese streamed in from seemingly every side, the Moorish governor abandoned the city to his fate. What followed was an intense street-by-street fighting within the city. For a time, no one even knew where Prince Henry was as the battle broke down into a series of individual skirmishes. Finally, Henry reached the citadel, within which the final defenders took refuge. That evening, the citadel fell, and Cuta was formally in Portuguese hands. The last defenders fled to the mountain, and the Portuguese flag flew over the citadel. The capture of Cuta was the first significant European victory over a Muslim army on their own soil since almost the First Crusade, over 300 years earlier. It marked a turning point in history. Europeans now held a base of operations in Africa. From there, Europeans would spread like dye poured into a bath across Africa, India, and ultimately the Americas. Cuta, while a city little known to people today, changed everything. While everyone else might have been oblivious, the meaning of Ciuta to Portugal was immediately apparent to Prince Henry. He realized this was only the beginning of the discovery of Africa. Ciuta was a springboard for, at the very least he saw it, the creation of a Portuguese Moroccan empire. And beyond lay the tantalizing prospect of the Atlantic. But for now, he remained focused on Morocco. After all, If the Portuguese took Gibraltar and then Tangiers, they would have dominant control over all the trade in and out of the Mediterranean. Keep in mind, there is no Suez Canal at this stage in history. And in less than 50 years, Constantinople was going to fall, cutting the West off from the wonders of the Orient. Someone needed to find a new way. When the Portuguese sailed home from Ceuta, They left a garrison of 3,000 men, over 5% of the fighting men they brought with them, illustrating their clear intentions to hold the city. The Portuguese left Cuta a changed kingdom. Prince Henry left a changed man. His self-confidence soared. All his life, keep in mind, he had been told tales of the vicious infidel, the scourge of Christendom, who had not been defeated on Muslim soil in over 300 years. Yet, Guta fell in a day. Suddenly, Prince Henry found himself wondering what more he might accomplish. As the navy reached the Atlantic and turned north toward Portugal, Henry would have seen Cape Spartel, the very western edge of Morocco. Yet he would have also clearly seen 
that the land did not end there. It extended southward. It was desert, of course, but still land. Old sailors had a saying about that burnt coast. On the very southwest tip of Morocco lay Cape Knot, N-O-T, named such for the saying that those who pass there, quote, either return or will not. To the south lay Cape Bojador, and beyond that, well, nothing. Or, at least, no one knew what lay beyond. Literally from the point where the Sahara hits the Atlantic south, no one in Europe quite knew what was there. It was an empty space on a map, a blank waiting to be filled in. While the Canary Islands were well known to European sailors, generally mariners avoided the region. The reason was simple. Once you pass where the westernmost edge of the Sahara hits the Atlantic Ocean, the Gulf Stream picks up and swirls south until carving out again and driving you back towards the Caribbean and North America and then ultimately Europe. However, the Gulf Stream made sailing back from below the Great Bulge of Africa nearly impossible for the type of sailing ships that the Europeans were using at the time. One simply could not beat both the wind and the current. If Henry was going to go beyond that point, he would need to solve that vexing problem. For now, however, Henry's problems remain closer to home. In 1418, Henry was recalled to Ceuta, which was under siege by an army from Granada. As soon as the besieging army saw Prince Henry's navy, though, it lost heart and gave up. Henry reinforced the garrison and the city was saved. But now, with an army and no one to fight, Henry was instantly intrigued by the idea of pressing on to attack Gibraltar. But King John had foreseen this and sent immediate orders to his son for the fleet to return. It was not so much that the attack on Gibraltar might fail that worried the Portuguese king. It was really that an attack on Gibraltar might be seen as a provocation by fellow Christian kingdom, Castile. And King John, well, he didn't want to anger Castile. So instead, Henry spent three months in Ceuta talking to various merchants who did business on the other side of the Sahara. He learned where the trade route wound and heard stories of fabled cities that lay across the unyielding sands. Interestingly, it was around this time that word of Henry's prowess began to spread throughout Europe. Clearly, he was an intrepid person. We already knew that. It was said of Henry, quote, he combined the disinterestedness of the scientist with the austerity of the saint, end quote. In fact, during his life, no less than two kings, a holy Roman emperor, and even a pope tried to secure his services. But Henry would serve no man. Like da Vinci, Henry was driven by his intense curiosity. He knew that the key to power was in the Atlantic. But he needed a place to work, a place to determine what would work and what would not in the mighty ocean. Ultimately, he settled on Sargis, on the very southwestern tip of Portugal. In time, it would become known as the City of the Prince. If Henry wanted to be in the sea and keep his feet mostly dry, Sargis was the place for him. There, the sea and the surge is never far. Standing on the most southwesterly point in Europe, one feels dwarf by the sheer immensity of the ocean beyond. Prince Henry, standing on this shore, was almost a perfect representation of Europe. He was a modern man coming out of the Middle Ages. His back was 
turned towards Europe where it had come from, his face pointing towards where it was going. In the 80 years after Henry began his quest for new lands, Constantinople would fall, the Hundred Years' War would end, and Columbus would cross the ocean. Between 1453 and 1493, literally everything was about to change. When Henry died, half of the Atlantic and the west coast of Africa had been explored. The main fruits of the Age of Discovery were yet to come, but there is little doubt that Henry planted the seed. Seafaring, however, is expensive today and was extraordinarily expensive in the 15th century. While Prince Henry may have been a prince, that alone did not grant him sufficient funds to explore the west coast of Africa, let alone the Atlantic. Luckily for Henry, though, years earlier, his father had made him the Grand Master of the Order of Christ, the order founded by the Catholic Church in 1318 after the destruction of the Templars. This position gave Henry access to significant wealth. That being said, when Henry died, he died in debt, having devoted all his funds and more to exploration. Why had no other Europeans explored the Atlantic before, though? We talked about the currents past where Africa juts out into the Atlantic and how those made travel beyond precarious. But there was more. One reason was simple superstition. There were wild tales about the Atlantic, and many people believed them. Another reason was just sheer economics. One sailed for the purpose of trading. Why bother sailing to points unknown if you didn't know if there were goods or people there? For this reason, the Atlantic was referred to as the Sea of Obscurity or the ocean of darkness. Europeans believed the sun grew stronger as you went south, and that those who went too far risked being burnt alive. They also believed that magical magnetic rocks to the south made it impossible for a compass to function. That being said, clearly not everyone had always been so superstitious. The Norsemen had sailed to North Africa. The Phoenicians and Carthaginians had both explored the coast of North Africa. Even Herodotus knew in the 4th century BCE that one could circumnavigate Africa. Writing of Africa, quote, Libya, that is Africa, shows itself to be surrounded by water, except so much of its borders upon Asia. Nico, king of Egypt, was the first of whom we know to prove this. He sent certain Phoenicians in ships, with orders to sail back through the Pillars of Hercules into the Northern Sea, the Mediterranean, and so return to Egypt. The Phoenicians, accordingly, set out from the Red Sea, navigated the Southern Sea, the Indian Ocean. When autumn came, they went ashore and sowed the land by whatever parts of Libya they happened to be sailing and waited for harvest. Then, having reaped the corn, they put to sea again. When two years had thus passed, in the third, having doubled the Pillars of Hercules, they arrived in Egypt and related what to me does not seem credible, but may to others, that they sailed around Libya. They had begun the sun on their right hand. End quote. Heck, maybe even the Atlanteans knew how to navigate the ocean. For more on that, by the way, check out our website or become a patron today at Patreon.com forward slash Western Civ Podcast for more Atlantis episodes coming out soon. Of course, the Arabs also knew vastly more about geography and astronomy at this point in history than the Europeans. Arab traders worked the routes across Africa and the Middle East. They knew there was much more to the globe, and moreover, knew that Africa has a beginning and an end, and thus one can go around it. Arab traders even told King Roger of Sicily such, as early as 1150. Historians today still debate the precise reason why Henry began his voyages of discovery. His biographer at the time lists five reasons. Number one, 
simply because no merchant was willing to do it. Number two, he wanted to know if there were any peoples south of Morocco with whom Portugal could trade. Number three, he wanted to know how far south the Muslim Caliphate penetrated. Number four, he wanted to find a Christian ally south of the Muslims. And number five, to spread the Christian faith. I want to say a bit more about reason four, this Christian ally. His belief that a secret Christian kingdom existed in Africa south of Morocco was not a new belief in Europe. What he is talking about here is the legend of Priester John, a figure I'm definitely doing a supplemental on. Priester John was an old Christian legend going back at least to the middle of the 12th century. According to said legend, Priester John was the ruler of an immensely powerful Christian kingdom, which lay somewhere in Africa. However, European geography was so poor that when the Mongols attacked the Muslims in the Middle East, many people thought this was Priester John. Priester John had, by the way, apparently, already inflicted a great defeat on the Muslim peoples of, well, somewhere at, well, some time. The legend itself is not big on specifics. Regardless, it was totally untrue, but that was who Prince Henry thought he might bump into. The value in the legend for Henry was that it meant that he could execute his voyages using religious funds with this ostensibly religious purpose. It was silly, but it served a very valuable purpose. And I want to stress that Europeans at the time absolutely believed in Priester John. Thus, as Henry said at Sargis, he was contemplating an endeavor that was simultaneously scientific, economic, and religious in nature. For months, he simply pondered. Then suddenly, one night, he summoned all his sailors and cartographers and declared that two ships were to be prepared as soon as possible. These ships were to sail as far down the coast of West Africa as they could and return with information and accurate maps. The sailors, of course, objected. There was nothing south except death. They were adamant. But Henry was firm. They were going to go south. They would go south, and they would prove it could be done. Now, these first two ships that set sail were not caravels, a type of ship we're going to discuss later. These were simple 50-ton half-deck ships with a square sail. Given their limitations, it's no wonder the crews who sailed forth felt certain they would never return. These ships could run pretty effectively with the wind, even on the Atlantic. But past Cape Knot, the notion that they could run against the wind seemed foolhardy at best. Henry timed the first expedition for the summer, when the winds blew south, a fact that I guess would make the first leg of the journey at least a little bit easier. Luckily for Henry, the men who ultimately did sail on this first voyage were up for the challenge, as were all of them throughout time. These were very tough men, though I should note they were not natural sailors, not yet. Eventually, Portugal would have little but sailors, but such was not the case even in the early 15th century. These were extremely hardy peasants used to very difficult labor and very difficult lives. But the grandsons of the wayfarers, they were not. In spite of the lack of this institutional knowledge then, these men had a deeply bred endurance, a quality that would save them more than once. Almost immediately after setting out, a gale blew up and separated the ships. One was driven back north the other to the southwest. It was the latter ship that would make history. Late one summer evening, the first ship limped back to Portugal, only to tell Henry of the gale and the certain destruction of the other ship. Henry, though, didn't have long to despair. A few days later, the second ship returned. Before the ship, 
even made ground, the men began shouting news from their oars. They had found an island. The captain related their tale. The ship had been driving nearly 400 miles southwest past Cape St. Vincent. The sailors assumed they were lost. One morning, after the gale finally ceased, the ship sighted a small mountainous island in the distance. With no other option, they made for it, landed, and charted what they could. Thanking God for delivering them, the sailors named the island Porto Santo, or Port Saint. Little did they know it at the time. Henry's men had just found one of the two main islands of the Madeiras, which lay almost directly across from Casablanca, nearly 300 miles in the Atlantic. Ironically, we now believe that the Genoese first found these islands in 1351, but that their discovery had since been forgotten. Henry questioned the men and determined that the island lay 500 miles from Portugal. Henry was exultant. It was believed that Castile already had a proper claim to the Canary Islands. But this, to his knowledge, was a new island chain and something Henry could use as a base for further operations. This was extremely good news. King John, once he was persuaded that Castile had no claim to the island, allowed Henry to go forward with further explorations. Prince Henry then sent these same two captains back to explore further and begin a process of colonization that would change world history. Interestingly, one future resident of Porto Santo would be none other than a young man named Cristobal Colón. Christopher Columbus. On Porto Santo, Columbus would learn about the art of discovery and cartography, skills I'm guessing you already know that he would use. Three new ships set out at once and quickly made their way to Porto Santo. They took along seeds, plants, and, unfortunately, a pregnant rabbit. That was unfortunate, because there were no predators on the island, and the rabbits quickly became a pestilence. The island itself was around six miles long and about three miles wide. The men quickly set to work charting its various bays and coves. Yet then they noticed something else. Another cloud in the distance. Clouds might mean land. And so, in 1420, another ship sailed in its direction. This time, they found the much larger island of Madeira itself. They called the island Madeira from the Portuguese word for wood, as it was densely forested at the time. This was like Henry winning the lottery twice in a row, because wood was like oil in the Age of Discovery. You had to have it to have a navy. You had to have it to build ships. And Portugal had few native forests remaining. Prince Henry was delighted that after the second voyage, he proved that voyage of discoveries could be repeated and they could be built upon. King John? Well, he was delighted both for the trees and because this all justified his belief in his son. Now, it was not for five years that the colonization efforts of the Madeira Islands really began in 1425. Interestingly, while Henry was pleased by the discovery of the islands, they always remained kind of a byproduct for him. His main goal remained, and always remained, the exploration of Africa for the reasons that we already discussed. And that makes sense, by the way, if you think about his perspective. He has no idea that the Americas exist. What makes sense is to try to find the source of all the wealth that flows north through the desert and into Morocco. So that's what he did. Thus, between 1420 and 1434, his mission was always the same. Go south, not west. Now, many of you probably noticed this already in the narrative. But in spite of his name, Henry the Navigator did not ever go personally on any of these expeditions. He sent out the captains and the ships, 
and studied the maps, but he never actually sailed. For those 14 years, his captains repeatedly disappointed Henry. Each came back with the same answer. They could not get south of Cape Bojador, the bulging cape where the current abruptly changes. Hence, for the time, Henry's efforts remained fruitless, and that probably tells us more about his character than anything. He never gave up, in spite of the fact that, for 14 years, he never realized a reward for his efforts. Now, one of the main problems facing Henry during this period was the type of ship he was using. These were called barks, or barinales. The bark was a square-rigged sailing vessel. The barinale was an oared vessel. The problem was that neither of these ships could sail into the wind. So when the current changed, the barks couldn't go any farther. Luckily for Henry, a new type of ship was evolving in Europe, the caravel. Developed by the Portuguese for exploring the coast of Africa, the caravel's chief excellence lay in its capacity for sailing windward. It was also capable of remarkable speed. Two of the three ships in which Christopher Columbus made his historic voyage in 1492 were caravels, the Nina and the Pinta. Ironically, the third ship, the Santa Maria, didn't make it back from the Caribbean, as we'll talk about in future episodes. The design of the caravels underwent significant changes over the years, but a typical caravel of the late 15th century may be described as a broad-beamed vessel of about 50 or 60 tons burden. Some were as large later on as 160 tons. Generally about 75 feet, 23 meters long, the typical caravel had two to three pole masts, lateen rigged, i.e. with triangular sails. Now today, most scholars believe that the lateen, so triangular sail, was actually an Arabic invention, which the Portuguese imported. A caravel would have had two lateen sails set atop a steeped mizzen mass. The caravel set much higher on the water than the bark, giving it significantly more protection when it was in the Atlantic. The key, though, remained in the sail and the rigging. Sailing with a lateen sail is vastly easier than sailing with a square sail. It has a wooden yard that supports that base of the triangular sail, and that's what swings around by using a simple block and tackle. You can't do any of this with a square sail. Two men can handle an extremely large lateen sail, but one cannot say the same for a square sail. As a result, the lateen sail remained dominant for centuries. Now, what sailors were able to do was change the direction of the sail. They could swing it around from side to side and tack into the wind. Tacking into the wind was the major nautical development that comes from the caravel and the lateen sail. Tacking is the concept of sailing into the wind using a diagonal movement. So you're cutting back and forth into the wind, but taking advantage of the ability to catch easterly and westerly gusts. So in other words, if the wind is blowing north, you can still go south. You just have to go south, west, south, west, south, west, south, west in a diagonal direction. So you're making little southerly movements and then catching the wind to go west. So you're moving at that diagonal shape. So now you're not trapped behind Cape Knot or Cape Boador. And so suddenly, the Portuguese realize they can go beyond these two points. The caravel, by the way, actually reflects the size of the craft. That's where the name comes from, which was small. Technically, it refers to the flush planking that was used for the deck and the sides, rather than overlapping planking. Not that that matters, but that's where the name comes from. These ships were constructed using Portuguese pine trees, and the harvesting of said pine trees, by the way, was stringently protected by the Portuguese crown. By the time of Henry's death, the caravel had ballooned to over 100 tons or more, with three and sometimes four masts. These later ships will match the image in your mind that you have when you think Nina Pinta and Santa Maria. They had two latin sails in the back for tacking, 
and a square sail in the front for speed. Like their Viking predecessors, the Portuguese knew the value of mobility. Thus, caravels had a very small draft, that is, the hull extended only a small way beneath the water's surface. This then helped the Portuguese explore the shallow coasts of Africa. Finally, for the first time, the Portuguese also used a ship that uses an axled rudder. Using a rod that rotates around a wheel which turns the rudder itself, now one man can generate vastly more power and gives the ship increased mobility. But I don't want to get away from it. The most important feature of the caravel remained its ability to sail windward. This gave sailors the confidence that they could explore further south and still make it back home alive. And confidence mattered. For centuries, Europeans had sailed the Mediterranean and the northern coast of Europe, but rarely, rarely out of the sight of land. The goal was always to hug the coast and island hop. In other words, to do what's called line of sight sailing. Now that's going to have to change if someone's going to make it across the wide waters of the Atlantic. Moreover, take a look at the map of the Mediterranean. You'll notice that you can sail a long way east to west, but not very far north to south. Hence, for the first time, knowing your latitude is really important when it comes to sailing. Longitude doesn't really matter since you're by and large going north and south. But if you needed to cut west to hit an island, you had to know your latitude. Thus, Henry developed a new kind of compass. Now, the compass in general was known to Europeans and had existed in some form for centuries. It's likely that it originated in China, as did most things. Henry's sailors used a magnetic compass kept in a small wooden binnacle next to an hourglass. Still, the only way, by the way, to keep time on the sea. Clocks, of course, were in use, but owing to the waves of the ocean, they didn't function at this point in history if you're on a boat. Now, using this compass, Henry began to develop charts. These charts would allow his sailors to voyage with confidence. One of the most important decisions Henry made was to recruit one of the top chart makers in Europe to his court, Jaime Cresques of Mallorca. It's highly likely that when Jaime arrived, he brought with him both his knowledge of charting and his mathematical knowledge of calculating far distances. He taught sailors how to calculate their mileage on the sea using rum lines. A rum line is an imaginary line on the Earth's surface, cutting all meridians at the same angle, used as the standard method of plotting a ship's course on a chart. There are 32 rum line points on a compass. I will not go into the math because it's way too complicated for me, but suffice it to say that using a rum line, and by the way, that's R H U M B line, a sailor could calculate their latitude with a pretty high degree of confidence. Henry's sailors also used an astrolab, a device imported from the Muslim world. An astrolab is any type of an early scientific instrument used for reckoning time and for observational purposes. One widely employed variety, the planispheric astrolab, enabled astronomers to calculate the position of the sun and prominent stars with respect to both the horizon and the meridian. It provided them with a plain image of the celestial sphere and the principal circles, namely those representing the elliptic, celestial equator, and tropics of Cancer and Capricorn. Now, because of such features, the planispheric astrolab really is regarded as kind of a rudimentary analog computer. It had several principal parts, a base plate called the matter, with a network of lines representing celestial coordinates, an open pattern disk called the RET, with a map of the stars, including the aforementioned circles that rotate around the matter on a center pin, corresponding to the North Celestial Pole. Finally, it included a straight rule called the Adelaide, used for sighting objects in the sky. All right, so how does it work? So basically, 
An astrolabe, if you were to hold, it looks like a series of disks with a pointer on the top. And the idea is you look at the night sky and you rotate the pointer based on the position of the stars until they line up. Then on the edge of the disk, you check the number and that should theoretically give you your latitude. Was it perfect? Of course not. But it was another essential device for late medieval and early modern sailors. That being said, the Portuguese, as Columbus would, still hugged the coast as much as possible. These devices were not perfect. The Astrolab, as an example, doesn't really work on the ship. The waves make it too difficult to line up the pointer. So to use it, sailors typically had to go to shore on an island and then determine their latitude before once more setting sail. But, meh, it's better than nothing. Even in the 14th century, the Azores, an island chain 800 miles due west from Cape Vincent in Portugal, was well known to Europeans. That being said, by Prince Henry's time in the 15th century, like the Madeiras, they were completely forgotten. Thus, in 1431, Henry sent out one of his best captains to find the quote-unquote lost islands. The first time he failed... Undeterred, Henry sent the man out again in 1432. This time, using precise mathematical calculations, they found it. On August 15th, 1432, 60 years before Columbus's first voyage, the men raised the Portuguese flag atop a small harbor they named Santa Maria. Santa Maria was the first of nine islands found by Henry's men during his lifetime. And, in 1457, just three years before Henry died, the northern and final grouping of the islands was added to his maps. In 1433, King John of Portugal died. He was 77 years old, and his reign had been one of the most successful in the history of Portugal. Henry clearly loved his father, but his writings illustrate how he felt very much constrained by him, especially in later years. John's eldest son, and now king, Edward, was thought to be much more pliable. Perhaps now, doubtless, thought Henry, he could be more aggressive. Henry returned to Sargis after briefly visiting Lisbon for the funeral and coronation. He was 39 years old. While Henry had been quite successful so far by just about any standard, Cape Boador and the shifting sands of the Sahara still managed to vex him and his captains. To an extent, this is understandable. As I've said, where the Sahara meets the ocean today remains treacherous, even in contemporary time periods. The waters are shallow, and the depths constantly shifting. Finally, By 1434, Henry told his captains he had had enough. They would be richly rewarded if they passed Cape Boador. Thus, that summer, one small vessel sailed out, determined to accomplish the task. The men took with them more rations than usual. Fish, salted meat, cheese, lemons, olives, and biscuits. They were prepared for the worst. As the days passed, and the ship proceeded further and further south, Suddenly there it was, Cape Boador, the unpassable point. The captain now had a decision to make, turn back or press onward. He chose to press onward. Then, before they knew it, the crew looked back and Cape Boador was behind them. They had done it. In the summer of 1434, they had passed the unpassable point. And behold, they were not smitten by the sun, The seas did not boil. They were not eaten. Just like that, a wall of superstition fell. The rounding of Cape Boador inspired Henry and his sailors. 
It confirmed their faith in science and their own abilities. From 1434 onward, the record is completely devoid of the word impossible when it comes to exploration. Cape after cape was quickly left behind as men became more and more familiar and confident with their abilities. Actually, this attitude was reflected throughout Europe. Most people initially had thought Henry insane. After all, he was exploring the coast of the world's largest desert with no immediate expectation of profit. Plus, Portugal was, if anything, underpopulated in the 15th century. They didn't need land. But now he had proven everyone wrong. After Cape Boador, Henry undertook a process of essentially continuous exploration. He believed in what he was doing, and he saw the economic potential in the voyages. To be clear, said economic potential lay primarily in one thing, at least for now. Spices. There was a huge demand for spices in Europe. Pepper, for instance, helped to both preserve meat and was highly valued as a home remedy for a variety of ailments. So valuable was pepper, it was frequently used in negotiations in place of money. There was an expression in the English at the time of a peppercorn rent to express the cost of living. The problem was, the ultimate Ottoman conquest of Constantinople and the Venetian colonies in the Black Sea was going to effectively cut Europe off from the traditional spice trade. In 1453, after Constantinople fell, the Ottomans issued an edict banning all trade with Christians. This, if it worked, would have effectively prevented the sale of 75% of the medicines being sold in Europe. Now, to be clear, some spices did still move east to west. However, the smugglers who carried those goods, they could charge whatever they wanted. That meant if Henry could find a way around the Ottomans, he could undercut their prices dramatically and still reap a massive profit. To make that next step, though, Henry realized he needed another base of operations and realized the Moroccan city of Tangier would be perfect. Now, Tangier lies on the northwestern tip of Morocco. It's 30 miles west of Ceuta and firmly on the Atlantic. As a result, it would be a much better staging ground for expeditions around Africa. King Edward was not opposed to Henry's suggestions that the Portuguese should attack the Muslim city of Tangier. After all, even on his deathbed, the deceased King John had entreated his sons to continue the war against the Muslims. However, the royal family itself was evenly divided on the question. Fortunately for Henry, King John's youngest son, Fernando, was absolutely set on the idea. Born in 1402, Fernando was too young to have taken part in the fight for Ceuta and wanted to prove his worth. Thus, after a year of wrangling, King Edward was convinced, and the Portuguese began planning another attack against the Moors. All while these preparations were going on, Henry continued to tell his captains to sail further and further south, convinced there was something beyond the burnt sands of the desert. The first few ships returned with little to show for the efforts other than a few sea lion skins. Ultimately, Henry's fleet was prepared to attack Tangier before his ships had actually discovered anything of note. Henry asked this time for 14,000 men. He got 6,000. He asked for the same number of ships that had been used to take Ceuta. He received a fraction of that number. Yet, in spite of these numbers, oddly, King Edward continued to recommend that Henry divide his fleet, a bizarre decision to say the least. The fleet set sail in August of 1437. It only took a few days to reach Ceuta, but there the troubles began. The garrison commander at Ceuta, noting how small their force was, urged Henry to delay his expedition and have his force join the garrison instead. Henry would not listen. The plan ultimately was simple. 
Tangier is only about 40 miles overland from Ceuta, and the army would march to the city, while the ships carrying their supplies shadowed them on the sea. Henry's forces quickly took the garrison town of Tutan, and on September 13th, reached the outskirts of Tangier, though many noted approaching the outskirts of the city on Friday the 13th, no less, was a bad omen indeed. Immediately, Henry noted that the city would not be able to be taken by direct frontal assault. He simply didn't have the men. So instead, in the face of some light skirmishing, the Portuguese drew off to their base to plan a protracted siege. A week went by as ships moved back and forth carrying provisions and materials for siege engines. But by September the 20th, they were finally ready to attack. This was the first major attack on Tangier, and it was an utter debacle. All along the walls, the defenders, who outnumbered their attackers, by the way, and were protected by firm walls, threw back the Portuguese. Henry fought bravely, but believe it or not, bravery is not enough to win a battle. Embarrassingly, the Portuguese scaling ladders were actually just too small. They didn't reach the top of the wall. So the ships went back to Portugal for cannons and, yes, longer ladders. A week later, the Portuguese attempted another attack, but this one went even worse. Now Henry found himself fighting on two fronts, as Muslim reinforcements had now arrived and attacked the Christians in the rear. Before the attack, King Edward made his orders crystal clear. If Tangier could not be taken in three attempts, the endeavor was to be abandoned. Henry was to go back to Cuta and wait for King Edward, who would arrive with a larger army. And then they would try again. Henry had already made two tries, and he wanted to make the final third attempt. So they built, wait for it, yet larger scaling ladders, as though that was the only problem, and tried a third time. In this case, the third time was not the charm, and the attempt failed miserably again. The problem was, by now, the roles were effectively reversed. So many Muslim reinforcements had come down, but now it was Henry who was besieged in his own camp. His few thousand men were now surrounded by literally tens of thousands of men from the nearby mountains. Henry despaired and realized the only way to get out was to withdraw by night, which is always risky, especially in the pre-modern world. The plan was to evacuate the camp and flee back to the beach. Ironically, given that this was ostensibly a religious campaign, the plan was betrayed by none other than a Portuguese priest. Instead, overnight the Muslims launched an all-out attack on the Portuguese position. Henry and his men held out, but at a massive cost of life on both sides. The piles of Muslim dead prompted the Muslim commander to try and sue for peace, but the terms were very harsh. Number one, the Portuguese must leave all their arms and armor behind. Number two, they have to surrender hostages. Number three, they had to give back Juta. The peace talks temporarily broke down when the mountain men serving under the Muslim commander rashly attacked against orders. Once again, the fighting lasted all day, but once again, the Christians drove the Muslims off with heavy losses. Once more, the onerous peace terms were set forth. Henry now accepted the inevitable and realized his situation was untenable. Thus, the only question was, who was going to be the hostage? Him or his younger brother, Fernando? Henry wanted to surrender himself, but his men would not allow it. Instead, he watched as his younger brother, Fernando, rode off to Tangier, a Muslim hostage. Sadly, all that still did not guarantee the Christians' safety. The tribesmen from the mountains 
did not respect the peace and fought the Portuguese all the way back to their ships. Under the biting rain of arrows and javelins, the Portuguese ultimately slogged back to the shore. The only thing positive about any of this was that because the mountain tribesmen had broken the peace, the Portuguese could claim that they no longer had to follow the treaty. And that meant, at least in their minds, they no longer had to return to Cuta. Not that they would have regardless. What that also meant, though, was that if they didn't return the city, Fernando was never going to leave Tangier. On October 20th, 1437, the Portuguese fleet sailed for home without their youngest prince. Prince Henry returned to Sarges. King Edward would have preferred that he come to Lisbon, but for three months Henry could not stomach to face his brother. It was not until June 1438 that he finally went to see the king. Interestingly, when Henry arrived, he presented Edward with a request. He wanted another larger army to return to Tangier. Edward was appalled. Had they not just suffered a dramatic defeat? He had no intention of throwing good money after bad. He would not hear it. Crestfallen, Henry turned his back again and returned to Sarges. The defeat and Tangier and the loss of his brother to captivity scarred him for life. But he would not let it be the end of him. Instead, Henry determined that he would devote himself once more to exploration and the wide open seas. In the summer of 1441, an event transpired that was to have critical consequences for Europe and the world, but was little noted at the time. While exploring, one of Henry's caravels captured a few of the natives and brought them back to Portugal as slaves. These, so far as I can tell, were the first West African slaves brought to Europe as a result of the Age of Discovery. As we know, they would not be the last. Now, to be clear, there is no indication in the record that Henry expressly told his captains to take these people, nor did he send them back after their arrival. Henry, from contemporary sources, never seemed interested in the slave trade as a potential source of permanent income. Rather, his dream continued to be to create a Christian kingdom south of Morocco. If he had to do it by converting those people there, then so be it. Quote, Dom Henry was not a mere slave trader. The capture of slaves was destined to serve a greater purpose, the conversion of those of Guinea into a Christian dependency of Portugal to be administered by the military order of Jesus Christ. The project was in substance similar to that carried out by the Teutonic order in conquering and Christianizing the heathen Prussians. End quote. The next physical boundary to be crossed was the White Cape, named such because of its long white plateau that appears to tumble into the sea. To illustrate just how far Henry's captains had sailed, the White Cape was over 320 miles south of Cape Boador. Hence, the conclusion is that Henry's men were now moving at an exponential pace. To an extent, this was because of how much better the caravel, now in full use, was compared to previously used craft when it came to navigating the coastline. In fact, Though they were well over 1,000 miles from home, the captain of these vessels often ordered that had to be careened and repaired on dry land before the tide returned. Now, no European captain had ever before attempted such a feat. Then, the caravel could easily beat its way windward past Cape Boador and back to the north. 
some of these first vessels finally began to return with news. The Sahara did not stretch forever. One ship in particular had gone down into today what is the coast of West Africa. They had seen green lands and great rivers and heard tales of Timbuktu, the rich African city that would fascinate Europeans for centuries. They even heard about the great Niger River and how it allowed access to the interior of the continent. It seemed it was worthwhile sailing south after all, especially if one was looking for profit. Immediately, Henry wrote to the Pope with an audacious request. He wanted all the lands to the south of Cape Boador to be immediately granted to Portugal, promising that he would rule them through the order of Christ. Pope Eugenius was concerned with the Ottomans at the time, as he should have been, and was overjoyed to hear that there was a way around the Moroccan stranglehold on North Africa. Immediately, in 1445, he issued a papal bull, granting everything that Henry asked for. Meanwhile, in Portugal, King Edward had passed away. His young son was a child at the time. And thus, the then regent Prince Peter granted Henry a one-fifth share in any profits from the expedition, an amount normally guaranteed to the crown, but funds from which Henry could launch more expeditions. It seemed it was a lot easier to go around the Moroccans than through them. For the first time in recorded history, Henry became the navigator. As Prince Peter wrote, quote, No one might sail down the African coast without permission from the Prince Navigator. If Tangier was a low ebb for Henry, the tide was now rising. However, if those years were ones of personal success for Henry, they were tragic years for the royal family. In 1442, Prince John, who had been assisting Peter with the regency, died, leaving only Peter to raise and tutor his nephew. Then, in 1443, news reached Portugal that Fernando had died in captivity in Tangier an event that doubtless caused Henry significant personal pain. Out of the five sons that King John left behind, only Peter and Henry were left. While Portugal might have been a troubled realm, Europe itself was starting to take notice of Prince Henry's expeditions. Rumors were swirling that someone found a way around the caliphate. If it were true, though, Henry sure wasn't saying. He guarded his secrets carefully, and smartly, because a short time later, in addition to enslaved persons, some of Henry's captains brought back gold from sub-Saharan Africa. They were the first men to ever do so. In 1448, Henry established the first ever European trading base in sub-Saharan Africa. I suppose if you wanted to, then, you could claim 1448 as the beginning of colonialism and imperialism. Though, this might be a bit of a stretch, given that I'm talking about one tiny stone fort on a forgotten bay. That same year, Henry's captains returned with more captives, continuing Europe's descent into the slavery business. Quote, So Nuno Tristio returned to Portugal with his captives, more pleased than the first time because he had taken more and also because he was alone, and therefore had no need to share with anyone else. End quote. Henry's voyages were changing Europe and the world, for better and worse. The horrors of slavery would act as a stain on Europe and, later America, for centuries after the practice ended. But Henry was the first of a new kind of hero for Europe, the warrior colonist. In this way, he more or less began to replace the Crusader. Indeed, it's only a hop, skip, and a jump from the Crusaders of the 12th century to the Conquistadors of the 16th. It had taken a quarter of a century, with little to show for it, but finally, Henry's policy was beginning to yield tangible results. Even if those results took the form of human cargo, 
as news qu spread quickly. Quote, Very early because of the heat, the sailors began to fill the boats and take the captives ashore, as they had been ordered. And when they were all assembled in this field, it was an astonishing sight, for some of them were almost white, handsome, and with well-made bodies. Others were black as Ethiopians and as ugly. But what heart, even the hardest, would not be moved by pity when seeing them gathered together? For some bowed their heads with their faces bathed in tears. Others groaned and raised their faces to heavens as if to implore the Father to help them. Others beat their faces with their hands and threw themselves full length upon the ground. End quote. As news spread quickly, merchants, kings, and princes, who had previously smirked at Henry's efforts as pointless waste of money, changed their tune. Before long, Spaniards, Italians, Dutch, and Englishmen would be sailing the seas looking for wealth, not wasting it. The Pope sanctioned it all, bringing Christianity to the quote-unquote heathen, even as it forcibly enslaved him. Do not forget as the first slaves arrived in Portugal in 1444, the kingdom was suffering through a severe labor shortage. Perhaps, thought many, this labor shortage could be made up using enslaved workers. Yet, Henry remained eager for his men to continue sailing further and further afield, past White Cape, Cape Blanco, to Henry. The problem was that increasingly, Henry's captains were disobeying his orders. Sure, they might reap rewards if they discovered a new island or a cape, but that was a might. It was a chance. There was sure money to be made raiding the increasing number of merchant ships now sailing to the Canaries or beyond. And that was how many captains chose to spend their time. The problem was, there was very little that Henry could do about this. His funds were limited and men could very easily earn more as proto-pirates. So if Henry sacked them, well then these men would just turn to piracy. Nonetheless, Henry found a few men willing to take the risks on his behalf. One such man was João Fernandes. The first man willing to go into the interior of sub-Saharan Africa. He landed just south of the Sahara, and then guided by Berbers, made his way into the desert itself, until he saw Tuareg Arabs for the first time, bringing his reports back to Henry. One important thing to recognize is that Henry's voyages, because he was not personally going on them, and because his direction left much to be desired, essentially he just kept telling them to go further, go further, that's it. Often the progress that the Portuguese made was halting, made in fits and starts, and then proceeded rather randomly in different areas. An example of this was the explorer named Denis Diaz. Fernandez, for example, did not explore up into the belly of the Sahara until 1448, but way back in 1444, Denis Diaz was already reaching Cape Verde, a chain of islands off the coast of the Ivory Coast today. While some men went south and hugged the coast, Others swept the seas further off. Cape Verde, for example, is about 150 to 200 miles off the coast of modern-day Africa. In 1442, King Henry VI of England made Prince Henry the Navigator an official Knight of the Garter, which might seem odd until we remember the connections between the Portuguese and the Royal House of Lancaster. After this time, we're told... Henry the Navigator reportedly grew more austere, more pious, though he had already been considered a very pious man, even in an age when piety was somewhat of an exponential concept. By 1448, the peoples along the west coast of Africa had grown wise to the slave trading practices of the Europeans and began to resist Portuguese efforts to explore and establish bases. Hence, the Portuguese explorers did the only Christian thing they could think to do, and used force to break the natives, writing back, quote, If you will allow us, we will arm our ships against them, and by death or imprisonment break their strength and power. And if God wills that this undertaking ends in victory, 
we shall be able to take a valuable number of captives. End quote. This was, of course, incredibly cynical. However, in the case of that letter I just read, the specific target for the attack was Argium Bay, which is over 1,000 miles from Portugal and other than Madeira, was the only realistic point at which the Portuguese might resupply their ships. Therefore, they had to have it. Morals be damned. Hence, in 1445, a fleet of 26 ships left Lisbon to subdue the area. The fact that Henry got 26 ships for the effort, by the way, is a testament to his success. The Portuguese, using steel and gunpowder, easily subdued the region. And one of the caravels actually continued to voyage further south, searching out riches, which probably meant slaves. This caravel was actually the first to make it all the way to the Senegal River. Henry's men had now made it over 2,000 miles from home. Is it any wonder that one scholar wrote about Henry in the 18th century in the following terms? Quote, what is Alexander, in all his glories, crowned with trophies at the head of his army, compared with Henry, contemplating the ocean from his window on the rock of Sardis? End quote. As Henry's ships continued, the following year reaching the Cape of Masts, only about 840 miles from the equator. This now brought the matter of the Canary Islands to a head. The Canaries had long been an issue of irritation to Henry. Castile nominally claimed ownership over the island chain. But there were many islands, and Castile only used two, and those only sparingly. Henry, after 1445, tried to get the remaining islands ruled by native leaders to willingly work with him. This, however, was a frustratingly slow process. Be that as it may, Regent Prince Peter remained opposed to conquering the islands by force, given that such an act would anger Castile. In 1446, the French noble, who had first conquered two of the islands, offered to lease them to Henry, who gladly accepted. But wait, you're wondering, what about Castile? I thought you just said Castile owned them. Well, you would be right. But that is because, unbeknownst to Henry, said French noble had already sold the islands to Castile. Hence, this guy tried to sell the same two islands twice. Frustrating for Henry, sure. In fact, this issue was not going to be resolved until 20 years after Henry died, when Portugal and Castile essentially just divide the islands in half. But that was in 1480, and by then, both were about to have much larger spaces to conquer. As an aside, there is some evidence that Henry believed that the Canary Islands to be the remnants of the lost civilization of Atlantis. For more on that, check out my Atlantis episodes on our website, or become a patron today at patreon.com forward slash Western Civ Podcast to get them all for free. New Atlantis episode coming soon, by the way. That being said, within Henry's lifetime, the Canaries remained, by and large, unconquered. Finally, in 1447, Prince Peter's regency ended, and King Alfonso, 14 years old, came to power. The change would prove to be a disaster for Portugal. The great nobles of Portugal had just been waiting for their chance to exert themselves. Now, with a teenager on the throne, and with Prince Peter struggling to maintain his own power base, many made a grab for control. Essentially, after 1447, Portugal descends into a period of domestic instability and occasionally outright civil war. Yet Henry stayed in Sagres, doing nothing, eyes fixed firmly on the sea. After all his years of hard work, the picture that was Africa was finally becoming clear on his maps. Henry was not about to let that dream go. Once Prince Peter resigned, the nobles ruled, and... Henry ignored all it, and just continued to explore. The irony of all this, of course, was, it was that Portugal's domestic tranquility was what allowed it to explore in the first place. Divided nations like Italy couldn't foot the bill for these endeavors. In 
Thus, Henry's refusal to help his nephew, or just his lack of interest in doing so, was sure to cost him in the long run. But he didn't seem to care. While this is not an episode on the royal history of Portugal, ultimately, King Alfonso was turned against his uncle, Prince Peter, by greedy nobles. The matter came to a head in 1449 when Peter was killed in battle. This effectively severed all ties between Henry and the royal house of Portugal. Not that it seemed that he cared that much. Interestingly, at this point, Henry asked King Alfonso permission to just go and retire in Ceuta. Clearly not wanting Henry to raise a rebellion, King Alfonso, or more likely the sycophants who surrounded him, refused. Henry was now 56. To him, Sadras seems to have become no longer the testing place for his dreams and ambitions, as it had once been, but a mere refuge from the world of men. While he could not leave Portugal, he still had his refuge, from which to derive some degree of peace. By 1449, Henry's men had been colonized Argium and were now working on Guinea. Prince Henry continued to encourage his men to deal fairly with the natives, and that seemed to be working, as we do not hear of any more armed conquests in the narrative. By now, everyone in Europe knew what was happening in Portugal. Word that Henry's men were returning with wine, sugar, gold, and slaves. By 1448, over 1,000 had been taken to Portugal, reached every court in Christendom. Whether he knew it or not, Henry had ignited the Age of Discovery. Other seafaring nations like England and the Netherlands were starting to take note of these new caravels. Their sailors claimed that only caravels could sail south of the Sahara. Is it little wonder, then, that the caravel quickly became the dominant sailing ship of the world? Ironically, the fame brought by Henry's voyages reflected back on the young King Alfonso, who had done absolutely nothing to aid in them and who had murdered Henry's brother on the battlefield. By 1450, so many voyages of discovery were leaving Portugal that most of them aren't even written down. Things that would have been miracles in 1430 were now simply commonplace, only 20 years later. Plus, in 1455, Henry's wife gave birth to a son, guaranteeing that his line would continue. For a man who in the later 1440s experienced almost nothing other than personal pain, the early 1450s were a dramatic reversal. Columbus would soon stand on Henry's shoulders and sail further than anyone ever had, almost literally. Columbus, as I mentioned, lived and worked on Porto Santo. There he studied and learned everything he could about Portuguese navigation, so much so that one of his subordinates claimed that he sailed, quote, as if he had been one of them. Henry was aware of the reports of his governors, that many believed a great landmass lay further west. However, Henry and Portugal, their goal had always been Africa and his never-ending quest for a way around the Muslims, and ideally, to Priester John. That being said, some of Henry's ships sailed west. We know, in fact, that one of his caravels discovered Newfoundland, 50 years before John Cabot. From the age of 60 until his death at 66 in 1460, Henry's intensity and energy continued unflagging. In fact, as his successes increased, he dreamed he might again lead a crusade against Morocco. After all, the recent Ottoman victory, which saw the fall of Constantinople, indicated that unless something was done, the Muslim armies might march across Europe. But though Henry likely did not know it, the time for crusading had passed. That being said, in 1458, Henry convinced Alfonso to try a smaller attack on the Moroccan city of al Kalar, a little west of Ceuta. Ironically, it was none other than Henry himself who had dissuaded the king from attacking Tangier, realizing a frontal assault would not work 
having tried it himself so many years earlier. This time to Alcalar, the Portuguese brought a large fleet, 220 ships, 25,000 men, though about half of them went to Quito. In September 1458, the attack began, led by none other than Henry, now a lean old man, leaning upon his battle standard. The garrison fought hard, but after a cannonball shattered one of the walls, it was over. The garrison sued for peace. Alfonso accepted, and then promptly left Henry to negotiate the specifics. Constantinople had fallen, but thanks to Henry and his expeditions, soon it wasn't going to matter. The Christians were going to go around the caliphate a different way. Henry left Africa for the last time in November 1458. The last two years of his life were occupied with many cares and responsibilities. He had never done any of this for the money, and when he died, he died vastly in debt. The moment he returned, he began putting his affairs in order, perhaps recognizing that the end was near. On November 13th, 1460, almost exactly two years from returning from Africa, Henry the Navigator died in Sagres. He was 66 years old. Ultimately, I find it hard to overstate Henry's importance in Western history. Someone had to be the first to try and sail beyond that which was thought possible. Granted, Henry never sailed himself. Granted, previous explorers did not have the benefit of the caravel. But all that being said, someone still has to put their money where their mouth is. They gotta be the first person to try. Without Henry the Navigator, there's no way you get to Columbus and, uh, you know, devil's advocate might say, the transatlantic slave trade. I'm never going to say that everything that everyone does is always right or morally fair. Genghis Khan left much to be desired. But we are where we are today because of those who came before us, moral failings and all. And Henry is what such man. Next time, we turn to Christopher Columbus in what will be a massively long series that will cover at least the next two months' periods. If you're interested in more content, there's hours of content on Alexander the Great, two and a half hours on the Russian Revolution, four, soon to be five, episodes on the history of Western thought, all the Atlantis episodes, all available on the website or for patrons at patreon.com forward slash Western Sit Podcast. Becoming a patron still remains the best way to support the podcast. Link in the show notes. And thank you for everyone who for two bucks a month supports what I'm doing. <laughs>